what happened when they when they met and when they had sex. So then there is a jump until Wednesday, uh, the 18th, when uh, Julian uh, did something else to her. She, uh, everything else is taken out, and it's and to me it's also strange. Why is it that Petra doesn't mention anything about it? Why is it that these two girls knows that we shouldn't talk about me being press secretary and the meeting with Julian on Sunday? And, and to me, it, yeah. it sounds to me like it. Uh, sorry, Peter, what would you no, want to right. say? I was just going to say that leads in very nicely with that point that I raised with you when we were emailing each other over the last week. And, and that was that it was on, I believe, the Wednesday when the alleged offence occurred of rubbing um, um, a part of his body against, um, um, oh, sorry, this, no, I think this is, yeah, this is Anna, rubbing yeah. his body on the back of Anna's back, okay? Yeah. And this is uh, some kind of a sexual offence that we would probably refer to as, or categorise as an act, some kind of act of indecency. Yeah. So they're, they're in the same bed, um, and he's done this so-called strange, strange thing. Um, but the confusing part about that is that why is she complaining about that, which is a relatively minor thing, when she has been allegedly raped three or four or five days before? This is what I don't understand. Yeah. I, I, I did. It took a while for me to understand that thing, too. And as it seems to me, Anna, in the interview with Kaisa Borines, that's, a, that's another supporting witness for Anna. In that particular interview, Kaisa Borines says that she met Anna after Anna had been to the police station, before Anna was interviewed by the police on Saturday. Anna then said something to Kaisa about Oh, I wonder how I can how can I explain at a trial that Julian stayed with me for so long? Okay. She was thinking about that, and and when I when I saw that comment, and then I connected it to to the statement of this strange behavior on Wednesday. To me, it seems like Anna's description of the strange event on Wednesday is used by Anna as an an explanation why she left the house on Thursday, because that's what she says in the statement. He did this to me, it was very, very annoying, so I couldn't stay with him on Thursday. So she's, and this she's, is, and, and this is the, the same guy that who has allegedly raped her for that yeah. before, correct? Yeah, so that's and this is, and the, and, and the rape, mystery. and the rape, the rape was okay. I didn't leave the house then, but when he took his clothes off, and and it, when you this, when you, the events described on Wednesday, when you, as she describes them first, it sounds weird, but well, when you look at the is context, she, is she making the accusation of rape, or is the, the police making the accusation of rape? Uh, as I understand it, when she interjected the sentence when the police were talking about Sophia. Then Anna says something to the effect, he broke a condom and continued against my will. That is, according to the police, a statement that she has been raped. That is why she is investigated on an interview on Saturday. In that particular interview, it seems like Anna is downplaying the what she said previously. And then she talks about, because she mentions this broken condom, she has to develop on the broken condom story. And that's why the broken condom story gets so strange because because she has to make she makes it up as there isn't there is nothing about the it doesn't seem like the condom story is, is right. There are so many weird details about it. It's interesting because in a certain way it feels almost to me, uh, and, and I'm I'm certainly no expert on the case, so I could be very, very wrong here. But I get the impression, based on what I hear you telling me, that it's almost like leading the plaintiff to the conclusion of rape. Um, almost like when, uh, I, you know, and Peter, I don't know if you have any experience with this, but when you have a, a child who is the victim of uh, incest or molestation, it's very, you have to be very 
careful how you question the child. And uh, um, yeah, this is a very very delicate area, and it, it, what it requires is is police officers they they have special departments that do this, and uh, they interview the children with a support person present, um, and that actually can be the main evidence in chief of that victim at a trial. Um, that, that, that's the way they do it. But the, the, the method of interview is, is, has got to be done correctly. You can't put uh, in evidence in chief, because that's a prosecution witness, you can't put words into that person's mouth. You have to keep asking non-leading questions. What happened next? What happened next? What happened next? You don't say, oh, he hit you 10 times, didn't he? You see, that's a leading question. They're not allowed to ask those questions. So those sort of interviews with children, um, uh, they have to be done very sensitively and, and, and gently um, and ask the right questions. Um, and then that becomes probably a, a, a more than a majority of a prosecution's case will be that first interview. It's a very, very important and crucial interview. There seems to be a fine line. The dealing with, sorry, there seems to be a fine line dealing with uh, questioning around the abuse of women, uh, like similarly the uh, abuse of children, and uh, for example, like domestic violence incidents. I don't know how they are conducted in Sweden or in Australia, um, but a lot of times when you have a, a victim of domestic violence, for example, they are completely. Uh, in a, if there's any sign of physical injury, the cop, uh, for example, in my state, you're required to arrest the uh, likely suspect. In many cases, oh, yeah. the husband Indeed. or the boyfriend. And, uh, and, and the, they will interview that person, they will take photographs, and they will assemble most of their evidence in, in, in that 24-hour um, uh, period. Photographs, um, uh, uh, interviews on video, and um, at the same time, they will go and arrest the wrong suspect. Yes. I think when an adult isn't fully developed em emotionally or in character, oftentimes they can kind of get led places because they really don't have maybe a strong enough center. I don't know if you're, you have a sensibility about just certain people, like they're, they're, they're externalizing everything, you know what I mean? Like it's what other people think or... Uh, maybe I should, if, if, if the cop is telling me that it's rape, maybe I should think it's rape, uh, sort of confusion. What is your sense of, in your opinion of just, uh, I don't know, legislation and... Um, okay, legislation. I, I, I think that's a good, good track to go on at this point. Um, and probably the best way to start would be to ask uh, Gorham um, as to what actually constitutes right in Sweden and then we can develop it from there and make comparisons and, and maybe get some constructive dialogue in, in that direction. So perhaps if, if Goran could, could indicate to us what are the elements that need to be proven by prosecution for a successful rape um, uh, charge. Okay. In order to convict somebody for rape, and I will talk about it now uh, as the offender being male and the victim female because it's easier for me to talk about it like that. It's not because it has to be, men can be victims of rape too. But in, or, in order to convict a man for rape, you have to prove, first of all, that there was some kind of, of sexual intercourse or something similar to sexual intercourse. Then you have to prove that the man used force or threat of criminal activity or, or some, I mean, you have to prove that there was violence involved. Then you also have to prove that the female objected to it very strongly or, or resisted the attack. Then you have to prove that the man knew that she was resisting and understood that it meant that she didn't want to have sex. And then you have to prove that he had the intention of, of doing this. So, it's, so there are a lot of things you have to prove which is, the, which the, is like the actual yeah sorry go on. yeah and that makes it very different uh, from I think how you treat it in Australia right 
Yeah, um, if I could just read an English translation um, that um, we've been looking at recently, which is the actual translation uh, from Swedish, and it says, a person who by assault or otherwise by force or by threat of criminal offence, forcing a person to sexual intercourse or to carry or endure a sexual act, which by virtue of the violation of the circumstances are otherwise comparable to sexual intercourse, is convicted of rape to imprisonment of between two and six years. Now, that's the fundamental paragraph of, of your legislation, correct? True. Um, but it doesn't actually explicitly put consent in there. No. Yeah. It, it's um, not in that. It's, it's, yeah. it's consent, comes into, consent comes into the case uh, because if if someone consents to an act, then it's not criminal. Yeah, because the next part of your legislation um, says, uh, again in English, a translation, I uh, believe it immediately follows what uh, the paragraph I've just read. The same applies to a person carrying out sexual intercourse or a sexual act under the first paragraph is comparable to sexual intercourse by improperly exploiting that person by reason of unconsciousness, sleep, intoxication or other drug abuse, illness, physical injury or mental disorder or otherwise in view of the circumstances are in a helpless state. So those two paragraphs seem to um, encapsulate the bulk of, of the Swedish legislation. Would that be a correct assessment? I would say so. Yeah. True. Um, but again, um, there's no explicit consent elements in that legislation. True. Would you agree with and, that? Yeah. And that is, and, and that's where the confusion lies. That's where all the confusion lies. Yeah. 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 Because when it comes to 